This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Very rarely will I turn down an offer to review a capture card, especially ones that claim to be 4K capable. This is what I do on the channel, something that I enjoy thoroughly. And so I was pretty stoked when Pingo reached out for me to review their new 4K HDMI grabber, as they called it, and see what's up with it. If you haven't heard of Pingo, neither have I. I tried to do some digging. All I could find was that they mainly sell like USB cables and audio cables and things like that. And as far as their translation issue and spelling error prone website indicates, this is their only actual capture card entry. And this is the Pingo 4K HDMI grabber. Doesn't really have much other model name other than that. It is very nicely built, has an aluminum body, big nice rubber pad to prevent slipping on the bottom. You've got HDMI 2.0 uh, input and output for pass-through, a type A to A cable that's included that's incredibly short, and I don't know why we keep seeing on some of these knockoffs A to A unless the licensing or the, the whatever is required to actually use specific ports is just that much cheaper for going A to A. And that's a little annoyance, and the included cable is very, very short. Over on the front, you have an indicator LED and a microphone and headphone jack, which would be good for a dual jack gaming headset that you wanted to hook up and get a direct feed of the audio and even add your microphone, but that doesn't really work all that well, and we'll touch on that in a, in a little bit in the review. But overall, for the build quality, it is actually pretty good. Now, one of the kind of misleading... Actually, there's a couple misleading things about the description of this product. I will touch on the big one in a minute but it describes full lossless 444. Originally it said capture. I think they've updated now after I've emailed back and forth with them, but it can pass through a completely untouched signal with RGB 444, you know, no compression on the HDMI output, which is very important for a lot of situations and really good to see. However, you only have two options for capture and neither of which are all that desirable. You have either YUY2 which is a 422 color space, so slightly compressed compared to uh, the raw feed, but still better than most capture cards. And then supposedly if you use the MJPEG decode format, which is pre-compressed and requires more decoding on your CPU power, supposedly that's giving you an RGB 444 color space, which is you know as close to the raw signal as you can get. However, it's in MJPEG, which is already pretty compressed compared to the YUY2 version. So the trade-off there kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I recommend just leaving it on the default YUY2 as that's the easiest way to go. If you don't know what I'm talking about with color modes and decode formats, I have a video sort of explaining this. I'll link in the card or the video description. The other big thing is this is not a 4K capture card. This is a 4K pass-through capture card. So you can send it a 4K60 signal from your Xbox One X, your PC. I even tested it on PC. I was able to send 4K resolution via my graphics card or PS4 Pro, it only captures 1080p 60. Doesn't capture anything higher. You aren't able to push any high refresh rate to it or anything like that. It is purely 4K 60 pass through, 1080p capture, which is fine. You get some nice downscaling ability and for most people, this is probably good enough. Most people don't want to pay an extra premium for a capture card that captures 4K when they're either just live streaming and don't need it or aren't making 4K videos, because for gaming stuff, most people don't see the point right now, and that's fine. Now, the MJPEG mode is actually supposed to be more resource efficient, as theoretically with their little pot player app, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you're supposed to be able to just dump the MJPEG compression straight to disk. I could do that with the YUY2 stream, but I could not do that with MJPEG, and so you're still using your CPU for some of the encoding. I'll touch on that in a minute. Now this will actually let you pass through HDR, uh, through the pass-through. However, like you can set up your system for it. I, I've seen screenshots of other people do this and it, like their Xbox One directly connected to it says it does not support HDR. Xbox One X's or Xbox One's uh, HDR capabilities are a little finicky. The PS4 Pro, I don't have the X, I only have a base Xbox One, so I can't test any of the higher end stuff with that. But my PS4 Pro was able to output 4K 60 HDR through a splitter to this and then through to a non-HDR monitor. So it's able to pass through the HDR, but if you have HDR, a si HDR signal going through, you're not actually getting any video feed that you can capture. So no tone mapping to SDR and no just capturing the raw kind of 
you know, washed out feed. It just won't show anything on your actual capture screen at all. It'll just pass it through and turn off the capture, which is fine for some people who want to enable HDR when they want to play it, but not necessarily capture it and then turn it back off when they're streaming or whatever. You don't have to mess with cables. It will support it, which is pretty cool. It also uses the UVC drivers, which makes it, you know, more universally compatible and lets it work with a wider variety of software because it reads as a webcam, which is nice, especially since you have that headset input. That also means that it works with Linux and Mac. I tried it both on my MacBook in OBS and in the QuickTime recorder. Worked fine in both of those. I, I'm not able to do extensive testing of this, especially since my Mac is a 2013 MacBook Pro. It's not really gonna do a whole lot of good capture stuff. And then I did boot it up into Ubuntu and it was detected in OBS. However, for both of these, I was only able to access the YUI2 stream. It did not give me any other decode format options. So that is worth noting if you care about that specifically. I don't see it as a big deal. It's cool that it works, but again, I could not do too extensive testing. In terms of what you can use it with, you can use it with pretty much any capture program, which includes OBS Studio, which is what I was using. Um, the audio stays in sync, it works fine with it. I had no major issues specifically with compatibility with OBS. The software that they recommend in the manual, however, not so good. Before we get to that, let's talk about the signal that you're getting from it, because you're getting 1080p60 in a fairly competent decode format. Usually looks pretty good. I've been pretty happy with the quality of it so far. It might be a little soft for what you'd expect coming from a 4K60 signal downsampled, but by the time you are compressing it for YouTube or throwing it in a live stream, you're not really going to notice any differences, and it's good enough for most use cases, totally, which is perfectly fine. I've tried the RGBM JPEG mode, the YUI2 mode, I've tried a few different capture method methods, they all look fine. I'm upscaling to 4K here and you're not going to see much of a difference. All right, so something you might have actually noticed there kind of contradicts what I said. As I was mentioning that you're not going to see a major difference in overall quality between the MJPEG RGB mode and the YUI2 mode. But you will actually notice a little bit of difference in contrast, or maybe it's a little bit of saturation. But this Neo example that I played is actually a fairly extreme representation of that difference. Uh, but if you show, if you look through me kind of scrolling through the PS4 menu, I actually switch back and forth between RGB and YUI2 modes. And you notice there's a little bit of difference in contrast, almost as if the MJPEG mode is using a different RGB range than I specify in the device settings. You know, the washed out versus overly contrasty look is typically an issue of RGB ranges mismatched between full and partial. And for console gameplay stuff, I always keep everything on partial, and that is what my device and my OBS settings are set to. But clearly there's a similar difference here. And I even switched my OBS recording mode between uh, NV12 and RGB, because I was doing my tests at RGB for the RGB mode, and that seemed to make no difference. So either it's changing the color space from 601 or 709 back and forth within the MJPEG mode, or there's an RGB range shift that I am not able to control. So you will see a little bit of difference in contrast in, you know, pump, oomph here, but you can compensate for that. And uh, typically the quote unquote washed out look is actually more accurate as things are very punchy in the other way, but it's going to depend on your situation. And upon second look, my original testing, even if I pull up clips of the same map, assuming that I set this up properly, because I did sort my clips b with ones that I recorded using the RGB mode and ones recorded with the YUI2 mode, they don't reflect this issue. So this might actually be related to a firmware update, which I will talk about in a moment in this review that was supposed to fix audio. I had some issues with the installer not wanting to install it right, and... Malwarebytes originally picked it up, so I had to pull it back out of the zip file. So there may be something weird with my firmware update, and I will work with them on it. And I am confident, based on my experience working with them for this existing firmware update, that they will get it resolved. But at the moment, for my situation, it's a little weird, but I need to get this review out. So treat this as a your mileage may vary, but likely to be fixed soon kind of thing.
Now, I originally had a whole section here talking about audio issues that I had with this device. This review was recorded back in late November or mid-December-ish, I don't exactly remember. And all of my recordings had super tinny sounding audio. It, was ju it just sounded really bad and really weak. And I spoke to a couple other creators that I knew that actually reviewed this capture card as well. And while they didn't have this specific issue, they did have other issues relating to audio. And so I reached out to my contact and that's kind of what delayed this review as I was waiting a few weeks for the actual uh, firmware update. They developed a firmware update that fixed this issue for me to come out. And then it took me a little while to get back on track with this review. And lo and behold, the firmware update that they released, although it doesn't seem to be installing properly as I just mentioned a minute ago and may have caused some color issues, which again, I trust that they will fix. It did fix the audio issue. Audio sounds fine now. So I'm going to report this additional issue to them and presumably it will be fixed in a future update as well, which is pretty cool. So if your audio is super tinny, uh, check their website for a former update or tool. And if they don't have it there, reach out to Pingo directly and request it. That will get you fixed up. Now, I don't normally test this stuff, but I want to be as thorough as I can and start testing this more often. It does have that headset input on the front. So I hooked up, I have a Sennheiser Mass Drop Edition gaming headset that I've been reviewing by suggestion of one of you, that I hooked it up to these inputs and it works. Uh, since the you will want headphones that have uh, audio level or volume adjustment on the headphones themselves because you have no control over this, which is kind of a problem. So I was able to listen to it, control the audio in the headset itself for volume, sounded great got everything passed through, hooked up the microphone part of my headset, and while it's not the best microphone in the world, it was way too quiet to be usable. I just kind of did a goofy, like, half gameplay commentary of me playing Blackout on Black Ops 4 on PS4, just for a capture test, and you have no control over the balance of your microphone versus the game sound. You have no separate ability to bring in the microphone alone into your capture software. It all comes in on the same input, and so the game sound ends up, ends up being louder than your microphone, and it's hard to separate and you just have no control over it, which was pretty disappointing because I, I don't understand why these features are being included on capture cards when they seemingly aren't built to actually work properly. This is a audio test running the Sennheiser PC37X Mass Drop Edition gaming headset microphone directly into the mic input of the Pingo HDMI grabber. Now the uh, firmware update to improve audio quality will, of course, help this out a little bit, but I do feel like the microphone audio is a little too quiet. By default, it's pretty much unusable, and what I had to do was actually use that firmware update tool that they gave me, and it has an actual volume mixer, so I could actually lower the game sound that's being recorded and increase the microphone audio sound. And so that mix is what you're hearing here as I play back in real time. However, I cannot find a trace of this tool on their website, and so you, I can't really tell you where to go download it if you want to do this for yourself. So you may have to reach out to Pingo yourself and be like, yo, where my audio's at? Don't really email them that. And see if they send that to you, because... Now, if you read the manual available online, it will recommend that in order to use this capture card, you try a software called Pot Player, which is a silly, stupid name for a program. It's a weird uh, <laughs> a Chinese developed media player, but the menu system is just confusing as all heck. It's kind of like Virtual Dub or VLC where you can play and capture stuff. The in manual has instructions for setting up capture of the capture card, and you're able to capture in a wide variety of formats. Now, one of the formats that I was really excited for was it said it could capture in ProRes. However, there's no MOV container option at all. It wants you to use MKV by default. And when I recorded to it, theoretically you can force ProRes to be in an MKV container and pull it back out later, but this one didn't work. YouTube wouldn't decode it, none of my programs would access it, and when I checked out the file with FF Probe, Probe rather, from FFmpeg, it seems to be missing a color format. Like the actual color format setting just seems to not be present. So I could not get uh, ProRes working. I could not get a couple of the formats working. I did get YUY2 raw straight to disk working, which used 
no system resources other than bandwidth to your hard drive. And that allowed me to get a really high quality file, but for like four minutes of video, it was like 90 gigabytes, which was <laughs> insane for most people. Like for me, I kind of like that, but it's insane. It also has uh, NVENC, uh, GPU acceleration for H.264 encoding, and if you have a capable processor, it will have QuickSync available as well. Awesome. The problem is, anything I have captured from the software has bizarre, almost interlacing looking scaling artifacts on text and things like that. Even in the raw YUY2 mode, it looks like it was stretched out with some really bad scaling, and so there's jagged edges everywhere, the text and, you know, white on black graphics look really, really bad. I have no clue why. I did so many tests trying to change, make sure all the resolutions matched up and everything, and every result I got from this bizarre and hard to use program, I mean, it's not hard to use, but it's more convoluted than it needs to be. All the results were just really bad. Now, the scaling artifacts aren't gonna be super obvious by the time you push it to YouTube, and I even uploaded the YUY2 sample to YouTube, and YouTube's own macro blocking prone compression winds up muddling, mudding that up anyway, so you can't really tell, and if you're live streaming, you're definitely not really gonna be able to tell, but it's not, well, if you're live streaming, you're not using Pop Player anyway, but if you're uploading videos to be compressed that were recorded in Pop Player, no one's really gonna notice, but it still irks me quite a bit. A new test I'm running on capture cards moving forward is testing the latency that they add via pass-through or in OBS or your, the native recording app. So the monitor that I test with for the pass-through, this LG 27UD68P or whatever it is, uh, is a really fast monitor. The top input latency is about 1.4 milliseconds and at the bottom we are around 16.8, which is almost as low as it can possibly go. Really, really fast. Now running that through the pass-through, we're getting 1.4 at the top and 16.7 to 16.8 to 16.9 at the bottom, which means that the pass-through is real-time, doesn't add any latency. That's what it should be, just making sure. Now my Dell production monitor that OBS and Pot Player are run on is also fairly fast, not quite as fast, but the top is 1.6 milliseconds and then down to the bottom is 17.1 milliseconds, which is just a little over the 16.67 minimum that would actually be output for uh, 60 hertz, you know, 60 frames per second. That's 16.667 milliseconds per frame. So it's only a little, you know, it only has a tiny bit of input latency with this test. Now testing this up against OBS and Pod Player, measuring just the bottom input since that is one complete frame, you were looking at an added 66 milliseconds of delay into the OBS preview feed for this capture device and 73.6 milliseconds of added delay into the pot player preview of input latency. So again, I'm not going to make any judgment statements as to whether this is good or not at the moment. I will have a comparative capture card latency video coming in the future, but I did want these statistics available in this video. Again, thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace empowers millions of dreamers, makers, and doers by providing them with the tools that they need to bring their creative ideas to life. On Squarespace's dynamic, all-in-one platforms, consumers can claim a domain, build a website, sell online, and market a brand. Their suite of products combines cutting-edge design and world-class engineering, making it easier than ever to establish your own online presence. Ready to start your new business? Make it with Squarespace. So head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your website, go to squarespace.com slash epostvox to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. For 150 bucks, this capture card is a decent value uh, for being able to pass through 4K but capture 1080p60, and th there are better options out there for this price range, I think, but if you're someone who specifically needs the Mac or Linux capability or compatibility, this might be an option to go with. Just a strange package overall. Product affiliate links will be in the description below. As always, if you want to pick one of these up for yourself, that was super overexposed. Uh, down there, while you're down there, hit the like button, subscribe for more tech education. I'm Vox. I'll see you in the next one.